Do you know that offense is a matter of choice? When someone says something or does something, you have a choice. You could either take it very personally and you can allow yourself to be offended. That's your choice. Or you could take it sometimes as it's meant, as not for you personally. It never, there are some people that never speak to you personally. If that is within you, you would be tempted to be offended when there is no offense intended. For everything in life is not personal. But you can take it that way. Oh, I remember the years. I used to hurt myself so bad because I chose to be offended. It took me a long time before I realized that offense is something being offended and feeling bad for oneself because of what someone else said is a choice. It's a, it's a, it's a matter of choosing. And you say, well, but people say, well, yes, they do. But it can't hurt you if you don't let it. If you turn to God and you keep your heart right with God, believe me, that offense will not touch you or hurt you. People go into their prayer closet and they pray against other people. Well, he hurt me or she hurt me. And they said this and they did that. <laughs> As though God is in your personal prayer closet to serve you with what you choose to do with your own feelings. It doesn't happen that way. It does not work that way. God, he says... Offenses will come in this world and woe unto those who bring offenses. Well, he's talking about something entirely different. An offense is something that hurts you. It's not something you imagine. It's not something, it is something that is aimed at you specifically. If, that, that sits down and, and targets you specifically. Like a couple of videos ago, I, I talk about a spiritual woman. I know of no woman like that. I don't have any of them in my life. But I remember the temptations of being a woman like that. And so, therefore, I could speak about it. I could speak about it with the power and authority of overcoming it. And I know that there are other women that exist. And I have, uh, from time to time in the last 50 years, come in contact with them. But do I hold that specifically against them? No. Why should I? That is their life. That is their choice. That is what they want to do. So if somebody comes along and they listen to my message and they choose to be offended, they choose to think it's personal, they choose to think that I've said this and said that for this reason, well, they've, they've entered into a place where they're going to get tangled up. Their minds and hearts are tangled up, and the enemy's doing a good job to do that to you. Tangle you up and get your eyes on other people and what they think and what they feel, when actually it's none of your business. But if you tangle up in thinking about this one and what they must be doing and what they must be thinking, and you're tangled up in thinking, well, that one is really this in, the, in judgment, you're tangled, tangled up in watching others in the sense that you're not permitted by God to do, and then you judge and condemn them and you do this, and then you're sitting down on your throne and you tell yourself, well, they deserved every bit I think because God is with me because you know what they did? They dared to offend me. <laughs> I am laughing at the ridiculous for when you are faced with the ridiculous, you laugh. You can't do anything else with it. I don't think of a single person who has the power and the ability to offend me. Oh, you can call me every name that you want, but I have victory in Christ Jesus over that because I died a long time ago when the best of the best said the worst of the worst, and none of it was true. They could not tempt me into bitterness, resentment, judgment, none of it. 
because I belong to Jesus. And Jesus Christ took no offense. If Jesus Christ would have taken offense, then he would have never been able to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He never would have been able to look up at God the Father and say, it is finished. He died so that you might live. He died so that you could allow your flesh to die. So that you can choose him above everything you think, feel, and do. He put you above everything. He put you above his own life. He was tempted in all points like as we are, and yet without sin. He never once said, Father, nail them. He told them plainly, he said, don't you realize that I can have legions of angels come and deliver me? But he chose not to do that because he knew the only way to save you from you, because most of the time, that's what your problem is. It's you. And you say, how do I know this? It's because I know the human flesh. I know the extremity of it, the extreme where I was entangled in the worst of the worst until God slowly led me out of my own mind and my own emotions and my own feelings. And I let him bring every thought captive. I talked to him about it all. It took me a long time. I didn't just jump from this place to that place as though God just freely gave me everything to walk and talk like Jesus Christ. He gave me freely salvation. He gave me freely the ability to get into heaven. But I'm going to tell you something that maybe you haven't even looked at. But you know, if you listen to the words of Jesus Christ when he talked about John the Baptist and how John the Baptist, there he was a great man of God. In the Old Testament, he was the best of the best. And yet, here's what God said. God said that even John the Baptist does not have as much as those that are the least in the kingdom of heaven. And then he tells you what the least is. He tells you that if you preach and teach to obey my commandments, then you are called the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But if you are teaching and preaching that to not obey them, to not, then you are called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Now, if you strive because you're going to behave yourself and do what is right, because you want to be called the greatest, you're already in the wrong pew. People don't strive like that and pay the price of dying to their flesh for their own selves. They do it because they love God so much. They don't want to do one thing that would possibly cause him to be disappointed in them, them uh, hurt him, anything. It tells you plainly the Holy Spirit can be grieved. The Holy Spirit can be frustrated. Even Jesus, when he walked and talked with the disciples, he, he, when he saw that they did not grasp what he was teaching them, and they were right with him, he said, how long will I suffer you? Means, how long will he endure their inability to grasp hold of the spiritual things? It was an endurance for him. It was a suffering for him. Because whenever you give out the truth and you walk and talk with people like Jesus did, and you give them out the truth and they still only see the flesh, their eyes only go to the flesh, and they don't understand. And he even told when they mind other people's business, like in John, where he said about living forever and never dying, and they said, are you saying that this man will never die? And Jesus said to him, what is that to thee? If I chose him to not die, what is that 
to thee. You might as well say, it's none of your business. I'm God, and I'm going to do as I choose. And what business is it of yours to tell me what to do with it is mine? You see, you can't go to God and tell God, that one must do it this way. If they don't, you already enter into a place where you are trespassing against what belongs to God because you didn't die for them. But you live under the assumption that if they don't follow your doctrine, they don't follow your way, they don't follow what you put in a box, they can never find it. So you dust your feet off of them and you don't realize that dust falls back on you because now you've sealed it that you can't really find Christ. You can only find your own church, your own doctrine, your own whatever. You've done that to yourself. And then if someone tells you the truth, then you become offended. You do as you want. You do as you choose. And God does not stop you. He tells you that. I don't stop you. Even if you don't choose him, he tells you plainly, I do not force you. I had to change things because suddenly it got dark here. And I heard my husband call me and he says, Marianne is what he calls me is Marianne. He doesn't call me Marianne. He calls me Marianne and it cracks me up. He says, Marianne, there is a tornado watch for Columbiana County, Columbia County, not Columbiana, Columbia County, which is where we're at right now. He says, and it'll be in effect for two more hours. Well, <laughs> I could get on my knees and I could cry out. The only thing that I would cry out is no one be hurt. That it not can come near anywhere or land where anybody can be hurt. That's all I would cry out for. But I have taught you that you have power over that. We've seen them form right in front of us. Just form and land somewhere else. <laughs> but I have things that need to be said today for people who need to hear the truth, for people to know what God is all about. You know, I'm going to be busy about my master's business. My master's business is doing the best I know how to do to help you, the best I know how to do to be with you. And I pray for those people right now out there that have become afraid, that hear the, the news flash and they become afraid. Oh, there's many elderly that become afraid. And Father, be with them. Strengthen their heart in faith. Let them know that you love them and you're with them. Thank you, Father. Oh, then there's little children who become afraid. They hear the wind and they see it and it frightens them. Father, be with them. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Part of the sky here is dark, but there it started to lighten up. And that's okay because there are those out there that need dealt with, the need to know that there is a God that need to know and experience praying, that need to understand that God loves them and not to be afraid. Anyway, I'm trying to put on my watch. I could put it on pause and put on my watch, but uh, I forgot to put it on this morning. I haven't had it all that long. And my husband did buy it for me. Hmm. Well, anyway. It's really funny how the darkness came so fast. And here, the light is here so, so much. <laughs> 
and the wind was just so whistling. And now this tree, this huge tree, has no wind. Anyway, what were we talking about? About choosing to be offended? Being offended where no offense is intended? Taking things out of context? Taking things to where they were never intended to be? People take the Bible out of context also. I just recently sent a message to some people, just a, a certain few. And it, what it really, the basics of that message was commitment. I have had people come to me and say, oh, Miriam, everything I have is yours. I will support you completely in every way. If we get money and this comes into our lives, this is how much I want to give to you. And they're committing themselves to that. And I say, wait a minute. Please don't do that. Please don't commit yourself to something emotionally out of emotion. Don't commit. You know, at one time in my life, I did that. And I loved people so much. I said, well, if I come into money, it's your money also. I will share it. And God said, Marion, don't do that. You want to be in a place where I will be able to tell you what to do with money. And you can't do that if you gather in people who have thoughts and feelings and needs and you hear them before you hear me. Because I know what they can do and can't do and who they are. I want you to never commit yourself to anybody. I want you to remember the Bible says that Jesus committed himself to no man because he knew what was in all men. And you can ask yourself, well, what is in all men? Well, the flesh, it's, it's, uh, it's not good. But that's really, I think, knowing what is in all men is the power of choice. That at any time they can change their mind. So when you commit yourself, okay, and then maybe something happens and you can't fulfill that vow that you committed to or that covenant that you made with someone and you forgot that you made it and the emergency comes up and you cannot go over here. You have to go over here. So I stopped these people as much love as they have, as much truth as they have. And they wanted so badly to be a blessing to me. That was fine. I found no fault in that, except to protect them. So when I talk to people and they say, well, I will always follow you. I will always love you. That is what Peter said to Jesus. I will die for you. I will always this and always that. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, before the cock crows, you will deny me thrice. That's what he said. Because Jesus knew the flesh. Did he love Peter any less because he could not keep his commitment? Because it, no, Jesus understood that he didn't know what he was talking about. Just like you and just like me. Do you think God loved me any less? When I was trying to be the head of my home because I had, in my mind, no other choice. Because I tried to be the spiritual head here and work it out there and pray and believe that I was the only one that covered when it wasn't true. Do you believe God held that against me? No, he didn't. You know what he did? He convicted me. He came to the place and he said, Marion, no, that is not the way to go. Look at him the way he is. Look at your husband the way he is. Don't look at him uh, out of offenses. Don't look at him because he didn't do what you thought he ought to do, or he didn't go where you thought he ought to go, or he didn't say what you thought he should say, because he is nothing 
nothing like you. And like I said, go back into my messages. Somewhere in the beginning, there's one that says, they cannot be like us. They look at us and they see that we are something in our dedication to God that they can never be. And they know it. You know why? Because God don't want them to be like us. God don't want them to look at us and strive to be like us because they are a man. And they're different. Believe it or not, they are different. And like I said, when you find a good one, oh, you find a precious treasure. I've had many women come to me and say, pray I find a good man. And I said, I can't. If God sends you a good man in the spiritual condition you're in, you would destroy him and make him what you want. That's not God. What is God is that you let God change yourself into the image of God by denying yourself, picking up your cross, and not taking every word he says as an offense because he doesn't do what you want. I told everybody, write down a list. On one side, put all the good things about your husband or wife. And on the other side, put all the things that you think are terrible and horrible that caused you so much pain. And if you read that list, it's way longer. And that list, when you actually look at it, it's selfish. It's a desire to have them say this, a desire to have them do that, a desire to make them feel this, that you, that, to make you feel this way, to do this for you, to do. It's all flesh. Did God condemn you because your list is all flesh for you? No, he didn't. He came to you and said, hey, think about what I'm telling you. Look at the good things about him. You're so busy. And God said these words exactly to me. You're so busy in what you want and what you think. You haven't even noticed he has striven to change. He is trying to change. And he doesn't have a chance because his help me is against him and not for him. He said, Mary, which Jesus, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, always calls me by name, Marian. My own fleshy dad called me Marianne. All of my four brothers called me Marianne. My only sister called me Marianne. My husband calls me Marianne. But Jesus calls me Marian. That's my name. So God says that he, that you, Marian, he said, you have the capacity to give me all, everything you are, everything in every way. He says, but he only has the capacity to give me this much so when you think that I am displeased with him, remember, he's giving me all that he has. And how could I be displeased with that? And if you would have taken the time to notice, you would see where he's been striving to change. And you would have prayed for him that he can when you see those things. And I watched him strive to change. And I would see him at times where he would fall back into his old ways. And when he would fall back, the first thing he would think is, I'm done for. I can't get up out of this. You know, a good man falls down many times and gets back up. But an evil man wallows in it and never gets up. But he's thinking, I, I blew it. How am I ever going to make it right? There is no way. And I can see that. Right there in front of me, him going through that. And that is when God told me to go to him. Be kind and be loving and say, sweetheart, there is nothing that you have done that God will not forgive. Just turn to him. And maybe at, at dinner time when I said blessing for dinner. Even if I knew I was not wrong. 
even when I knew that I was right in the things that I was doing and saying, I would say, Father, before we thank you for our food, forgive us and wipe away every trace of anything that we have done or said wrong. Cover it with your blood, Lord. Do you know that is how he got saved, was praying at the blessing at the table? I have gone through the room and seen a cloud when my husband went in this room and went to bed. And I would enter the room and a cloud of glory would be right there in the room. And I would look at him and he was all wrapped up in pure snow white. He was as clean as the blood of Jesus Christ that covered him. And he had peace and he had joy because he was with God. But you know, a church member would come up and say, well, you're not going to our church. But you see, God knows how that man has to grow and how long it would take him. But you come and knock at the door and you say, well, he doesn't believe like me. He doesn't think like, so he's got to be wrong. And you judge and condemn him and you dust your feet off on him and you curse yourself. Hear what I'm telling you. What you do to others will come back to you. And when you think that you are because you have a, a place in the church or because you're a deacon or because you're a pastor, that you have the power to judge and condemn the innocent because they don't know what you know. They haven't gone where you've gone, but you judge and condemn them to have nothing. So when you go to them, you say to them, if you don't give your life to Jesus Christ and come into our church, and come and serve God the way you should, because the Bible says you should, you're going to go to hell. And if they don't receive and accept what you have turned into your own ways and your own lie, you dust your feet off on them. And every person that God intended to save, you are destroying. Because you don't have a true witness from God. A true witness from God judges nobody. I mean, you see a drunk out on the street. You don't know what caused him to be there. You don't know what happened to him. You see a drug addict. You don't know what caused him to do that. You see a homosexual. You don't know what caused them to do that. But you judge him. That one's going to hell. And if they don't change and come into our church and read the Bible and do it, they're going to hell. And they're going to get into heaven before you. You know why? Because you're the hypocrite that sits here and says, I got it all. And I have the power to judge. And someone will come along and tell you the truth like the spiritual woman. And you'll look at them and you'll say, uh-uh, that person is filled with this. I'll judge them. That person is doing that. Oh, there is no such thing as truth as the prophet. There is no... No, no, that's not me. I know better. Because you're not easily entreated by God to change your mind, to think that it's a possibility you could be wrong. And he said that kind of thinking is very hypocritical. And the prostitute, the drunkard, all of them can get in before you will. And as a matter of fact, at the judgment, they'll be sitting there in a place of honor when you are not. And you know why? Because when God come to them, they didn't say, uh, hey, not me. I didn't do that. They said, Lord, forgive me. Is it I? When they searched into the Bible, they looked at it and said, did I really do these things? I'm so sorry. But you see, the hypocrite that sits high in church, they never look at that. I know I've got it. Why, I can remember the day that I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Sure you can. And on that day, did you live what he said? When you came home and your child irritated you, did you rant and rave and rail at it? Did you beat it unnecessarily? 
Did you get angry at her wife, your wife because she did not serve you the way you thought she should? Did you, as a wife, get angry because he wasn't doing what you wanted him to do? All the things that make you a hypocrite. But you don't look at those. You look at everybody else. You don't ever think for one moment you could be wrong. That's a hypocrite. They are almost impossible to save. But the sinner, oh, they know they're sinners. They fall to their knees, knowing with all their heart. What is it going to take for the hypocrite to fall to their knees? Oh, but I've served God all these 50 years, 30 years, 20 years. I know what I'm doing. I know I've saved many souls. Hmm. Are those st souls still walking and talking with God? Do those souls, have they overcome their problems and their troubles because of your influence in them? Have, have you really made an impact for Jesus Christ to heal and deliver them? Or are they in the same old, same old? Do you still have women coming to your church where their husbands will never come because the wife thinks she's more than what she is and is able to run to you and lie on him? I'm not telling you about the ones that beat their wives because I'm telling you, the Bible says a husband of contention, we have no such custom. Contention means to compete with. Contention means to fight you, toe to toe. And if you're foolish as a Christian woman enough to fight the enemy toe to toe, you've got a problem because you're fighting back. Jesus didn't fight back anybody. He didn't jump up and scream and yell. He didn't lose it. He didn't get upset because somebody offended him. He didn't do that when he watched them nail his hands to the cross. He didn't look down at you as he was dying and say, oh, look what they're doing to me. How dare they? He didn't do any of that. If Jesus Christ is inside of you, you will look at them and you will look beyond their faults and see their needs the way Jesus did for you. You see, the biggest thing that God has is love. The greatest tool in life that you have to defeat the enemy in your family is love. And if you look in Corinthians, you will see that love is unconditional. It has nothing to do with how you are treated. Nothing. Oh, I've been persecuted and hated and cursed at by the worst men of God. People who thought they had it all. And I watched God. I never said one word back to them. And I watched God save them. I watched them all come back. Some took a year. Some took two years. Some took two minutes. Some took five minutes. But they all come back and said, Marion, God showed me you're a Christian. I'm so sorry for what I said. Did he do it because I'm anything? No, I, I obeyed the word. The word said a soft answer turneth away wrath. It literally, one person can't fight. So if they come in, and mine, drunk, used to, he never came, entered into the door. He barged in. A Marine thinks the best defense is to attack. When they know they're positively wrong, that's when they knock you off balance. And then agitate you and irritate you to get you to be just like them. And then they can sleep and say, she said she was a Christian, but look at her. She gets as angry as I do. She rails the way I do. She's no different than me. I don't have a thing to concern myself. I can be same old, same old, do exactly the same thing. I can remember his mother getting angry with me. And this was years ago. I'm talking 50 years ago. Because... I needed him desperately. She knew I needed him. 
And she says, why are you not angry with him? And I said, to be angry with someone who is in oblivion, they have no feelings, they have no thoughts. They are so filled with that. It's like getting angry at a retarded person, trying to reason with someone who has no reason. You get angry with a drug addict. They, it's unreasonable. Why? You hold it against them and you hate them. I've talked with drug addicts in Salvation Army. When an 18-year-old who did every vile thing he could do to steal from his family for his drugs, come crying that now I found Jesus Christ and my family don't want me. Well, what did you expect, young man? You have to give them time. You have to forgive them for not wanting you because they have to forgive you for what you did. It all starts with forgiveness. It all starts with kindness. It all starts with Jesus Christ. So if you want to be offended with the words that I say, have at it. Because I know with all my heart, I'm speaking truth. I know that it's not to hurt you. I know with all my heart that it is to help you. It is to find some way to reach you that you could let Jesus Christ in. I know it's not personal. I don't know any of you personally. And all the ones that I knew know personally, they would never write bad things to me. They would never tell me bad things because they know their life has changed from Jesus Christ in me through prayer. So I know. Accept what you want. And if you don't like me, click, change the channel. Get somebody that will tickle your ear and tell you how good you are. And you can go down the road as happy as a lark. Whatever you want. It's your choice. Be offended. That's your choice. All of life is a choice. You can either turn away from what you're doing and turn to God with all your heart. But you see, that's the hard way. Dying to self is the hard way. And the flesh hates it. It doesn't want to do it. But when you love God, you love him more than you do yourself. You love him more than what you think, what you feel, and what you want. You love him more, and you realize how much love he has for others that you think are deliberately offending you, that you see personal. Because all that your husband may doing, if he does it, would never hurt you, and he has never, I mean, physically beat you, and he has never cheated on you. You take everything he says and does personal enough to destroy your marriage, marriage and take on the headship, which is not yours. And you don't help him as a helpmate to become what he needs to be. And how do you do that? Through love. Looking beyond his faults and seeing his needs. Seeing the man that Jesus died for. That's how you do it. That's how it gets accomplished. 